<sighs> Hello, y'all. I uh, I got a little bit teary-eyed during that video. Um, I've been a part of the United Methodist Church since I was a baby, and this uh, this is huge. And I'm really excited to be a part of a church um, where these moves are being made. And also just here specifically at this site, we're in a place of growth in life. We can hear babies in the building, which is beautiful. Like, I, I'm so serious. There's just so much life here, and I'm so happy to be a part of that with you all. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, welcome to the gathering. I'm Sarah Rugenstone. I'm the site pastor here at our Clayton site. And I also want to say before we get going today that if you ever need to take a break from our service for any reason, we've got a library out here next to our nursery um, for a moment of quiet should you need it. We also have the service streaming out here in our side lobby with um, some seats and fidgety activities that all ages are welcome to. So, there you have it. All right. Now, I'm going to kind of break the fourth wall a little bit here. Not really, but kind of. When the site pastors preach, we all get together and we chat about the up upcoming sermon and brainstorm ideas together. That's right. We collab. Um, so, as we discussed this sermon kicking off our Minor Prophet series, we asked the question, who is the one who's got something to say in your life? Who speaks hard truths? And the other site pastors each named one of their kiddos. And I don't have kids, but I thought, you know, <laughs> there's something there. Because I have worked with a lot of kids from multiple babysitting jobs, volunteering in church, nurseries from middle to high school, Sunday school teaching, nannying, VBS leading, camp counseling. Let me tell you. As all of you who have been around kids probably know, kids will tell it to you straight. <laughs> yeah, society has not tight, taught them the social niceties and how to people please and placate people. They say what they think. So, <laughs> there was one little lady that I babysat while I was at Duke. We were really good buddies. We would go to the park, make paper dolls, find good sticks for drumming on nature walks. We had a blast together. But one day, I came over to watch her, and I came inside, and she was just glaring at me. And noticing the sharp vibe shift from our usual greeting, I said, oh, hey, girly, what's going on? And she goes, what is that? And she pointed, horrified, to the bright red angry pimple on my chin. <laughs> Ah, yes, little one, what is stress acne indeed? <laughs> Just you wait, child, it gets worse. <laughs> yeah. But I also think back to a time in high school when I was a sophomore. I worked on Wednesday evenings for our church's child care, and I was working with pre-K or kindergartners. They weren't, they weren't, super, um, weren't super big. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they had been with them the whole year, so some of the kids knew me, and I knew them. And I usually came with a lot of energy, smiles, and would spend time investing in their games. Well, one Wednesday, I remember I was incredibly off. Um, and I know why. It's, it's etched into my memory. I had a moment where I put myself out there with a crush in a class, and oh my gosh, did it backfire. <laughs> and it, it should have backfired. It was weird. I had no game. Still don't. Anyways, I was convinced that this was it. I was socially done. I was very internalized that Wednesday night, replaying the cringiness of my actions over and over and over and over until this little guy named Bruce, yes, Bruce, um, a little Bruce. We always did puzzles and we played dinosaurs together. He came, he came over to me and he like, he like tugged on my arm. He's like, hey, Sarah, snap out of it. <laughs> we have Play-Doh. <laughs> and he really did snap me out of a funk. I realized I was there to be with the kids, to invest in them, and I hadn't been doing that. And Bruce let me know. <laughs> so we played with Play-Doh, and I thanked him for snapping me out of a funk. And I, that kid's probably like 15, 18 by now, doing great things. Um, but I've often found that children are little modern-day prophets. 
In the Bible, a prophet is someone who speaks hard truths on the behalf of God. So who shares hard truths with you? And how do you receive them? I invite you to hold these two questions as we learn from the prophets who spoke challenging truths on, the behalf, on behalf of God. Who shares hard truths with you? And how do you receive them? So today we're starting this new series, Uncomfortable Truths. We're looking at hard words and warnings that the prophets say on behalf of God and what we need to do in response. And we're focusing on minor prophets. And you might be asking yourself, (laughs) what's a minor prophet? Ah, yes, there are major and minor prophets. Major prophets being Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The distinction between the major and minor prophets is just the length of their scrolls and the audience they were addressing. So the minor prophets are 12 books of the Old Testament, which is nearly one-fifth of the Bible, and yet their voices are rarely heard because people, people don't really love to read the prophets. I don't blame them. It can be a bit doomy and gloomy at times, but the prophets played a really important role speaking truth to power, naming uncomfortable realities, and reminding people of what they were call- the way they were called to live. Their voices were not popular, but they were necessary. That was true then, and it's still true today. I- I'm going to be real. I wasn't super eager to preach on sin and judgment Like Amos, my guy, did it have to be this harsh? Spoiler alert, yes, it did have to be that harsh. But anyways, I'm not a huge fire and brimstone pastor, not my vibe, so I promise that that's not where I will leave you. There is hope with our prophets as well. But sometimes, however, we do need to sit in the muckiness of our wrongdoing and wrong thinking, so we will sit in this together today, okay? So, starting with Amos. And Amos is the third book of the 12 minor prophets. Remember, minor only in that they're shorter, not less important. So here are our minor prophets. We got Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Baby names, anyone? (laughs) The book of Amos begins like this. This comes from Amos 1.1. These are the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. He perceived these things concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, in the days of Judah's king Uzziah and in the days of Israel's king Jeroboam, Joash's son. Now, Amos is from the south side, um, a.k.a. Judah, and it's about 11 miles south of Jerusalem, which if you can see it, Jerusalem's kind of right there at the top of that orange right there around the top of the orange line, and he's 12 miles south of that. He's a herder and a shepherd, and he proclaimed God's word and judgment in the north, known as Israel. Actually, a few of our prophets dabble in farming, shepherding, and agricultural professions, and I don't think that's a coincidence. It's almost as if God wanted the prophets to sow seeds amongst the nations as well, to guide God's people as well, We love some gardening and shepherding metaphors played out in real time. And Amos is going to do just that. He's going to lead God's people. He's a prophet, after all, one who speaks for God. His message warns the nations and the people of Israel of coming judgment, of exile and devastation. It's a wake-up call, a harsh but necessary reminder that God cares deeply about justice and will hold us accountable. The message is bound to sting a little bit. Mm. And as we continue to set the scene here, note that the northern kingdom is led by King Jeroboam. And Amos speaks to this kingdom during a time of prosperity and peace. Jeroboam is leading the people of God into a time of wealth, but also a time of apathy, allowing just injustice and idolatry, meaning when people love or worship anything more than God. Those silly people, we would never. 
Just kidding. We do that all the time. Okay. During our own seasons of peace and abundance, it's easy to get a bit lax, to forget about God working in our lives all together. Because, hey, things are pretty okay. We don't need anything. We got this. We can lose our focus, our, lose our commitment to our faith practices, and that's when things start to get real messy, and that's when we need our prophets. Enter Amos. So one of the indictments, is, um, Amos names, is selling people into debt slavery and not giving them legal representation. Another is worship disconnected from life or worship not informing how one treats people. The point here being that the result of true worship is that over time it changes how we live, who we are, and how we treat people. So Amos is calling out false, lifeless, inauthentic worship. Amos also names these sins and per, names these as sins and pronounces judgments. It's important to note that he calls out nations surrounding the people of Israel. However, his indictment is three times longer for the people who are in covenant with God. You see, God's expectations and standards are higher for with whom people are, or sorry, God's expectations and standards are higher for people with whom God is in covenant or relationship with. One author put it this way, a great calling plus a great responsibility equals great consequences. Or like Uncle Ben said, remember, with great power comes great responsibility. So, from Spider-Man, <clears throat> if, if just for the reference. Tony McGuire, Spider-Man. Okay, <clears throat> so people who God rescued from Egypt have lost their way and are selling people into debt slavery. The former slave became the slave owner. God is furious. After all, these are God's people. The warning to us today is once you receive blessing, deliverance, freedom, the warning is do not forget where you come from. Do not get so far removed that you forget the struggle. Do not lead people into a similar struggle. We must be careful not to lead others into situations by omission or commission, unconsciously or consciously. So take a moment. What's something that you've overcome with God's help? And now how are you talking about and treating people who may have that obstacle today? Maybe with God's help you've overcome some self-centeredness, some addiction, bitterness, lack of boundary, people-pleasing, apathy, going along to get along, chasing money or success. Take a moment. What have you overcome with God's help? And how are you talking about and treating people who may have that same obstacle today? Amos calls out God's people, but also tells them to turn around. The churchy word for that is repent. And here's how it sounds in Amos. The Lord proclaims to the house of Israel, seek me and live. But don't seek Bethel, don't enter into Gilgal, do not, or cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal will go into exile and Bethel will come to nothing. <laughs> seek the Lord and live, or else God might rush like a fire against the house of Joseph. The fire will burn up Bethel with no one to put it out. Oh, <laughs> Y'all, these uh, prophetic texts are ripe with literary devices. Um, so we got us repeating, seek the Lord and live, to really drive home the point, turn back to God. It's in the undoing of old things, in the burning evil things down, in renouncing our misguided beliefs and thoughts that we make more room for God's love and justice to bloom. Seek the Lord and live is repeated as a word of encouragement to turn around to turn to God and away from idols and injustice, to make things right with your neighbors and with God. So one time um, at Greenville, a guy in my class told me in front of the whole class uh, that I was hearing my call to God wrong since um, I was feeling called to ministry and also a woman. So 
Naturally, this caused some bad blood between us for our remaining years <laughs> at Greenville. But my senior year, I preached at our evening service, and um, he came up afterwards. And I braced myself for something negative. But instead, he said he was sorry, and that he recognized how harmful his words likely were to me. He'd been working on healing that confining belief that was etched into him by his past churches. He'd been talking to professors. He'd been listening to women preach. He was wrong, it turns out, and he made things right. And someone, somewhere, confronted that man with an uncomfortable truth. It wasn't me. <laughs> I just mean mugged, meaning I glared at him every time I saw him and made pointed comments in class about how women deserve to be in ministry. What? I, I just, I had to make a point. <laughs> um, but I am thankful for the prophets in my own life, but in others' lives as well. And prophets don't mince words. Their messages are really harsh. But even in the cut of these words, hope drips through. Listen to these. This is from Amos chapter 2. The Lord proclaims for the three crimes of Judah and for four, I won't hold back punishment because they have rejected the instruction of the Lord and haven't kept his laws. They have been led off the right path by the same lies after which their ancestors walked. So I will send a fire on Judah and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem. And then hear these words from Amos 2 as we get into the crimes that Israel has committed. Notice that all sorts of groups of people are being called out, almost like no one group has it all together. So this comes from Amos chapter 2 as well. They stretch out beside every altar on garments taken in loan. In the house of their God, they drink wine bought with fines that they impose. Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them whose height was as tall as cedar trees and whose strength was as strong as oak trees. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. Also, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to lay claim to the land of the Amorite. I raised up some of your children to be prophets and some of your youth to be Nazarites. Isn't this so, people of Israel, says the Lord. Now, I bet you're like, Pastor Zara, where is the hope in that? It sounds kind of bleak. And it is. It is bleak for the systems of power that seek to hold God's people in a tight grip. God said, I will send a fire on Judah and it will devour the palaces. It said that God uprooted people who were feasting on the labors of others. The scripture says God pulled out the bearers of injustice, stem and root. And then we also see that God reminds God's people of where the heck they came from. That God has delivered them, so will God not do it again? Isn't this so? So you know how I said a lot of the prophets were farmers or shepherds or in some way mindful of the land that they lived on? Well, I love this tie to the earth and the tilling of the land because here's the thing that a lot of farmers and gardeners know to be true. There is a lot that you have to do in order for something to take root and grow. It almost, some of it even almost seems antithetical to growth, the pruning, the weeding, but it's actually refining, is it not? Sometimes forests and land has to be burnt crushed for the life to spring up again. It's almost like God knows this too. And as the all-knowing gardener, God is willing to burn something down in order for a new thing to spring up in its place, filled with anticipation, hope, and perseverance born from the ashes of what came before. So what? What do we do with these uncomfortable truths in the ashes of our old ways? 
I asked you to consider two questions at the beginning. Who gives you hard truths and how do you receive it? So kids are one example of people who speak hard truths. I also have some really close friends who act as prophets in my own lives, who I trust and have built the safety needed in our friendships to be able to say hard truths to one another. And y'all, it's still hard to receive those words. It's disconcerting. It's awkward. When I'm presented with a hard truth about myself, I typically retreat to process and relive the scenario a few hundred times. Pastor Charity, our pastor of groups and spiritual formation, is also preaching this week on Amos over at McCausland, or McCausland site. And she asked her Facebook friends, what do you do after receiving a hard truth? And over 50 people responded. Here are a few of the replies. One, shame probably first, and I want to retreat. I've learned through Brene Brown training that shame resilience means I need to not retreat, but ask the person to explain and then give myself space to receive empathy and tell them I need to process what they have said. We often think that we need to respond immediately, but we don't. We should reach out to a close friend for empathy and for helping us process what we've heard. A couple people said they barf. Um... (laughs) Somebody said, (laughs) I fret, I lose sleep, I consult with people I trust, I make excuses, I get mad, I speak sarcastically about the situation that brought my uncomfortable truth to light, I whine, I deny, blame other people, and only in recent years do I find I have the humility to own my stuff. (laughs) And even then, I'm not great at it, always learning. Four, from Chris Pondoff himself, right hook. (laughs) five hear it get angry typically defensive then apologize to those who were around me when I acted that way then face what's true tear it into smaller portions swallow and digest six love that place in myself ask God to live and love you there too As you can see, some of these are really healthy answers and some of them are really honest, and all of them are really vulnerable. And I know that we can all use a little bit of encouragement hearing and receiving hard truths. So here are four practices to try when you're confronted with an uncomfortable truth. Listen, don't debate. Don't go turning it around on them. Check out that blank in your own eye. Now, in fact, I've actually found it to be helpful not to say much at all. Be sure you understand what's being said, but don't counter it. So asking clarifying questions, but being sure not to ask questions that try to disprove or to disqualify their truth-telling. Clarifying. And then sit with it. Pray about it, talk to someone trusted about it, journal, even bring it up in therapy so a professional can help guide you through some ways to evolve. Do not get stuck in this step, though. If you're anything like me, the shame cycle can be a really hard one to get out of. Remind yourself that you're human and that you're actively working to be better. So have grace for yourself. And then three, make a change. Make a way. Make a change and break a... Okay, sorry, that was an intrusive thought that I followed. Now, <clears throat> allow yourself to be refined by this truth. Prune away the thorns on you that are not serving you or anyone else. Weed out the ways injustice sneaks up on you in your own life. Change is not instantaneous, but a process Take small steps and remind yourself it won't be overnight. It takes effort to untangle old habits and create new ones. And four, I said it already, but I'm going to say it again because it's important. Have grace for yourself. Listen, all of this is a process and it takes time. Give it the time that it takes. That's also a gardening tip. It takes time. You are a little plant that's just trying to grow in some pretty rough conditions. That is the work. One pastor said it this way, it takes time to live into your healing. 
We get to a point in Amos where you don't have to read in between the lines to find as much hope, so much. It's at the end, chapter 9. <clears throat> On that day, I will raise up the meeting tent of David that has fallen and repair its broken places. I will raise up its ruins and I will rebuild it like a long time ago. May we bask in the knowledge that the all-knowing gardener will never leave us in this stage of the gardening. God tends to us, refines us, grows us through every stages of our life and every stage of our brokenness. Even through disappointment and anger, through Amos, God offers and speaks restoration upon God's people. I often think of Jesus and his prophetic work and how he named the hardest of truths but never left people in them. He always invites us to come along with him. Friends, the road to restoration includes repentance and renouncing our former ways. And that can be a really painful process. But wherever you are, God's word of hope and restoration is not far off, even in the midst of an uncomfortable truth. We see this hope all over our gospels of Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection. It reminds us that sin and death do not have the last word. Jesus is faithful and meets us in our burnt down, broken, uprooted places and promises to repair and raise us up again. I want to leave you today with a little message of hope I found one day scrolling through Instagram. It comes from a tiny prophetess. Hear her words of hope as we close today. So important. It can make a bad situation even better than better. Do you feel like there's a lot of hate in the world? There definitely is. How do we change that? One smile at a time. If you make one smile, maybe maybe you can make another smile and another one and another one. And soon, you'll make the whole universe friendly, probably. <laughs> do you think kids can make a difference? Well, of course they can. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you have to change how you are. What do you want the adults watching this to know, Cassidy? Well, you need to give yourself a chance. Like I said, one smile at a time, you might change the world. Will you pray with me? God of justice and restoration, we pray today as you continuously refine us. May you hold us near Draw us closer to you as you work to make us better, as you work to make us more how you envisioned. Thank you for not leaving us in the ashes of our wrongdoings. We thank you for bringing us up again from ashes, breathing new life into us as we go. May we always be reminded of you and our need for your breath in our life. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.